Good morning. Thank you, Dean Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Mahmoudi. Uh, thank you to the Baha'i Chair for uh, inviting me to participate in this um, important gathering of uh, scholars, of uh, practitioners. And what in the 21st century is more important than world peace? Immigrant children are the fastest growing sector of the child, youth, and emerging adult population in a growing list of high and middle income countries. This morning, I will first review the most recent data on major global migratory flows over the last couple of decades. Second, I will turn to the data specifically pertinent to the United States and to children and youth. The data from 2000 to today will tell a very powerful story. Third, I will offer some reflections on mass migration, its opportunities and challenges to the defining institutions of our society with a focus on schools and education. In the 21st century, globalization is the macro context for mass migration. Think of globalization as three M's. Markets, their integration and disintegration. Media, the new information, communication, and media technologies that enable the deterritorialization of labor and put a new premium on knowledge intensive work. And mass migration, the human face of globalization. The three M's of glo globalization in synchronicity have generated the largest movement of people in recorded history. Today, global migratory flows involve diverse populations from heterogeneous sociocultural, racial, religious backgrounds. Since the dawn of the millennium, the world is witnessing a rapid rise in the number in the numbers of a plurality of immigrants, voluntary and involuntary, internal and international, authorized and unauthorized, environmental refugees, and victims of human trafficking. Today, the lives of over a billion people, a billion people, are shaped by migration. They are either international, or internal immigrants, or family members left behind. All of these flows have intensified under the ascendancy of climate change, weak and collapsing states, war and terror, and growing inequality. During the second decade of the 21st century, 240 million are international migrants, approximately 800 million are internal migrants, and millions and millions more are relatives left, left behind. For the first time in human history, every continent on Earth is experiencing the massive movement of people as areas of emigration, as transit areas, or as areas of immigration, and often all three at once. The data 
in this graph suggest that the largest movements of people today occur between South and West Asia, from, and from Latin America to North America, and within Africa. While normative mass migration, that is, migration is constitutive of the human condition, uh, just about 3% of the world's population has been on the move for over the last two generations. So the rate of global mig migration fluctuates at around 2.5 to 3 plus percent of the world's population. Today, Europe and North America attract over half of the world's immigrants. Europe once led the world on emigration from the end of the Napoleonic Wars to the first quarter of the 20th century, Europe sent over 60 million souls to the New World. By now, as if by centennial design, Europe has recaptured its lost population in the form of new immigrants. Almost the numbers are almost identical. Europe, it's as Europe struggles with the integration of its new immigrants, presents perhaps an important point of comparison to the experience of other high-income countries currently dealing with large-scale migration. To paraphrase Tolstoy's beautiful first line in Anna Karenina, when it comes to immigration, Europe and the US are families, each unhappy in its own way. In Europe, the challenge is managing the unprecedented arrival of over a million refugees from the Middle East, as well as the failed citizenship a term coined by uh, Jim Banks at the University of Washington, Seattle, failed citizenship, and the disconnection of large numbers of the second generation, the children of immigrants, from um, the narrative of the nation state. In our country, we are unhappy, perhaps, in the high a rather stable number of unauthorized uh, uh, immigrants that has been more or less a protected feature of our current immigration malaise. The United States is less than 5% of the world's population, yet today we probably have a quarter of all the unauthorized immigrants in the world. With four times more immigrants than the second largest country of immigration, we lead the world once again. In the United States, immigration is both history and, as the data I will share with you this morning will suggest, destiny. Why do people migrate? Freud, in exile, living in London, the last interview he gave to a journalist was asked uh, the famous question, Professor Freud, you've spent your life studying the human condition. What then is your formula for a happy life? Expecting a lengthy thesis from the aging and genial professor, the journalist got three words, love and work. If you can love and work, you should be a happy person. Love and work and war are at the heart of migration's global teleology. My approach to immigration 
is informed by an interdisciplinary sensibility that locates the family at the center of the symbolic, legislative, and social universe. Family separations and reunifications and migration for the sake of the family unit defined differently in various regions of the world constitutes the ethical framework for today's migration. If globalization is the macro context for migration, the family is its meso context. An ethic of family nurturance, reciprocity, caregiving animates global migration in the 21st century. It is what drives Ukrainians and Uzbeks to Russia, Indians and Indonesians to the Gulf countries, Senegalese, Algerians, and Moroccans to France, Chinese and Indians to Canada, Brazilians to Japan, Ecuadorians and Romanians to Italy, Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, Micronesians, Africans, Latin Americans to the United States. Worldwide, civil and ethnic wars, structural violence, environmental cataclysms, and poverty are behind the largest displacement of people since World War II. Today, there are over 65 million forcefully displaced and over 21 million formal refugees, half of whom are children. Every day, every day, approximately 40,000 human beings are forcefully displaced from their homes. Catastrophic migrations pose new international risks to millions of immigrants and challenge the institutions of sending, transit, and receiving nations alike. While immigration is normative, it has taken a decisively dystopic turn. A footnote that I think makes a larger point. In 1998, in Honduras, a devastating hurricane forced over 2.5 million folk to leave their homes many began a massive exodus to the United States. And the hurricane, of course, was intensified dramatically by the massive deforestation in the Central American landscape. If you want to understand Syria, and the largest human catastrophe in modern history, you need to understand water, and you need to understand the environmental context that is um, at, the, uh, at the foundations of the current horror that we're seeing. Fast forward then to um, uh, the summer before last, and we witnessed a new and holy trinity of human, narcotics, and gun trafficking, growing inequality, and continued environmental cataclysm in Central America, and then the massive exodus of unaccompanied minors to the southern border of the United States. Once again, seeking, seeking refuge in our country. Worldwide, perhaps 25 million people are now environmental migrants. Some call them environmental refugees, a figure that by some estimates will likely grow to 200 million by the midpoint of the 21st century. Immigration is the human face of globalization. 
Globalization's utopic promise and dystopic aftermath have made cultural diversity increasingly normative in the world's mega cities. Our world is much more diverse in terms of languages, religions, and ethnicities than ever before. Diversity and super diversity define the demographic, social, and cultural sphere of the world's leading global cities. Leicester, England, Leicester, England, and Amsterdam in Holland will shortly become the first European cities with non-white majorities. Rotterdam today is over 45% immigrant. Frankfurt today is about 30% immigrant. Sweden, a country of 9 million people, now has 1.5 million immigrants. The Swedish story is a very fascinating story. Sweden sent about 1.5 million immigrants to the New World a century ago. Again, fast forward a century, and uh, in a cycle of completion, it now has approximately the same number of immigrants it sent to the New World. In New York City, this morning, children from over 175 countries and territories got up and went to school, something that simply never happened before in human history. One city encompasses the entire range of the human experience. In Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and The Hague, two-thirds, two-thirds of children in schools come from immigrant origin homes. In, Stock in, in Stockholm, Sweden, 40% of students come from immigrant origin homes. In Reggio Emilia, over 35% of the children in the famous, maybe the most famous preschool in the world, are now non-Italian children of immigrants. In Paris, a third of the children are immigrant origin. In Copenhagen, a fifth of the children are immigrant origin. In Southern California, we're seeing something very unique and very fascinating. You know, Jefferson once said, we all have two cities, our own and Paris. Today, the world has two capitals, their own and LA. Think of it this way. The second largest Mexican city is, does anybody know? It's Guadalajara. The second largest Mexican city in Mexico is Guadalajara. There are more Mexican citizens, people born in Mexico, in LA, than there are people in Guadalajara, making us the second largest Mexican city in the world. One of my colleagues at Harvard once said, LA, a once and future great Mexican city. <laughs> but it's not just that. From Armenia to Korea, from Mexico to Iran, from Cambodia to Israel, today, LA has the second largest number of citizens for about 12 plus major countries in the world. We are the other Mexico, we're the other Armenia, we're the other um, Iran. Immigration, and here is my definition, is an ethical act of and for the family. Research suggests that four family members today depend on the remittances sent by every Latin American immigrant living in the United States. Last year, it surpassed 440 billion, more than double the combined international aid. India leads the world in terms of remittances sent back home, uh, while the rate of remittances has slowed, it remains proportionally higher than all other flows. 
according to the World Bank, immigration and remittances today probably is the largest poverty reduction effort the world has seen. And if you pause and metabolize the figures, they really should take your breath away. Think of it this way. If you're in Pakistan, roughly 42% of the GDP is now repatriated by immigrants living abroad. A tiny number, proportionally speaking, of immigrants are carrying 40 plus percent of the entire GDP. The, there are now a growing list of countries where a quarter of the GDP is now repatriated by immigrants in the diaspora. Immigration generates a powerful demographic echo. As families are reunified, the children of immigrants take the center stage. The children of immigrants are the fruit born of immigration. Today, in our country, a quarter of all children under age of 18, a total of over 19 million children, have an immigrant parent. Their growth has been rapid. In 1970, the population of immigrant origin children stood at 6% of the total child population. It is now projected to be over a third by 2050. The children of immigrants are an integral part of the national tapestry. The education and well-being of these youth touches a growing swath of our child population. The story of the children of immigrants is deeply intertwined with the future of our nation. Globally, immigrant children are the fastest growing sector, sector of, child, of the child population in a disparate list of countries. In Canada, over 90% of the demographic growth moving forward will be through the children of immigrants. Italy, Australia, Israel, New Zealand, and of course, nearly every Western European democracy. You have rapidly aging populations, below replacement fertility rates. The only sector of the population that is now growing in many, many Western European countries is the immigrant and now refugee origin population. In our country, for the first time, the children of Asians and Latinos account for nearly all growth in the child population. The new data revealed that between 2000 and 2010, the number of Latino and Asian children grew by more than five million, while the number of white non-Hispanic children declined by over four million. Here, and you can see Maryland, are the states, uh, including Maryland, that are already minority majority in the child population. Of course, California is already a minority majority state. The family is the most important institution qua immigration. Immigration challenges and changes the family. One family starts immigration, another symbolically, often structurally reconstituted family completes the cycle. Consider these data from the LISA study, that's a longitudinal immigrant student adaptation study of the Harvard Immigration Projects, I co-directed with Carola Suarez Orozco, examining the cha changes in life and family uh, over time um, in a sample of approximately 
400 newly arrived immigrant youth and their families coming to our country from China, various Central American nations, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and Mexico. 85% of the LISA study sample revealed a complex constellation of family separations and reunifications varying in lengths and types. In some cases, the children are separated from both parents or from one parent than the other or come from single parent households with siblings trickling, trickling in or a child sent ahead. Complicated family separations and reunifications, too often the product of our dystopic immigration system, affect family attachments and under, undermines the symbolic, legislative, and social coherence of the family. Complicated transitions subvert traditional authority systems and roles. Children acculturate at record speed and come to learn about their rights in ways that often leave their parents behind. Customary and codified child re rearing and dis disciplinary systems of authority often come to clash in our courts with American legal practice, codified and customary norms. The LISA data reveals very significant differences between immigrant groups. Families coming from China as a group tended to migrate as a unit, while the circumstances of migration for the Haitian and Central American groups imposed family separation during migration in the majority of cases. Immigrant children today, just as they were historically, are most likely to be separated from their fathers and to be separated from their fathers for lengthy periods of time. Even as the family is the bedrock of migration and at the very center of the conceptual and policy work for migration in most advanced post-industrial societies, the process deeply destabilizes the social unit. Complicated family separations and disruptive reunifications create an undertow threatening the transition to schooling and the well-being of millions of children in the new country. Education systems around the world then are facing unprecedented challenges and opportunities. Today, we have to educate ever more diverse cohorts of students to much greater levels of competency at a time when economies and societies are more integrated and vulnerable to global upheavals. The world is also more unequal, and rising inequality has become the elephant in the schoolroom. Concentrated disadvantage, a term coined by my, my former colleague uh, Bill Wilson at Harvard, triple segregation, a term coined by Gary Orfield, my colleague at UCLA, and the widely acknowledged failure to fully integrate large numbers of children of color in the US and other high-income countries remains a protracted problem. Once the envy of the world, schools today seem to be manufacturing boredom and mediocrity. We did a very simple study 30 years ago. We asked children to fill in the sentence, school is. What do you think the answer is? Boring. And if you're a boy of color, it's boring and dangerous. This is the 
racial poverty uh, disparities in our country from the National Center for Child uh, Poverty using the federal definition of, uh, of poverty. And this, these are um, breathtaking uh, statistics, the number of children living below poverty in, uh, in our country. Sorry, that, didn't, <laughs> that doesn't show. But um, what it really suggests is that the best predictor of who's going to graduate from college is your parents' zip code in the United States. So um, children in the top 20% of families will graduate from, from college at a rate approximating 60%. Uh, children in the poorest 20% of families will graduate in college um, at a rate of less than 10%. So then, as we're facing the greatest challenge education systems in all high and middle income countries are facing, we must pause and ask, what is education for? What principles ought to animate our conversation about education as a public good? Education, we know, is more important than ever before in human history, and we now have a much fuller understanding of the causal pathways by which education generates better health, a more muscular citizenry, and patterns of status mobility. I was, um, in, in listening to um, the video uh, from uh, Professor Domacello, uh, I was reminded of, um, I was reminded of um, Darwin uh, in a furiously creative moment. He's writing the diaries and he jots down in, 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 a, uh, in handwriting in uh, the margin of the diaries a famous line, educate the girls. This is <laughs> prophetic, uh, right, uh, over 150 years uh, before we had an understanding of precisely the causal mechanisms by which literacy literally saves lives. Darwin was struggling with the idea that investing in the literacy of, of girls particularly is by far your best investment in education as a social, as a public good. Of course, education as first envisioned by the ancients is about the idea of the flourishing of the human child to her, to his full potential. The ideal of the Greeks of the eudaimonic principle. In particularly in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, of course, education, it's especially in its formative, normative period, was envisioned as a tool for civic engagement, for belonging, and for citizenship. When the great John Dewey was imagining, and the Horace Mann, a, 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 a public, a, a secular, free, non-denominational educational system, citizenship was fundamentally at the center of that imagining. And of course, the third principle, unfortunately, the principle that now tends to be fetishized, is the idea of the education as a function of the, its link to the labor market, education for jobs. When our politicians talk about education, that's what they talk about. But education can't be reduced to labor and to economics. 
education fundamentally. I wrote a book many years ago called Educating the Whole Child for the Whole World. Educating the whole child to flourish, to become an autonomous agent of her or his own destiny. The case for education has been made before, and we need not reiterate it here. Suffice it to say that a strong corpus of economic, sociological, psychological, demographic, anthropological research has mapped out the effects of education, measured often by years of schooling, or literacy on individual socioeconomic mobility, human capital, social cohesion, social capital, health, and well being. The preponderance of evidence for some time now is hardly surprising. Schooling tends to generate powerful, virtuous cycles. Perhaps the most exciting of the more recent findings is the general nexus between schooling, literacy, and health outcomes throughout the world. And here, I point you to the work of Bob and Sarah Levine at Harvard and David Bloom at the Harvard um, School of Public Health. In our ever more interconnected, miniaturized, and fragile world, Cultural, linguistic competencies are at the center of the new skills that we will need for all our children to thrive moving forward. In the global era of mass migration, schools the world over are pursuing multiple normative ideals, instilling 21st century skills and competencies, fostering cohesive social relations, crafting the tools needed for immigrant and refugee children to engage as effective citizens and workers in their new societies. We must all endeavor to disrupt gaps in achievement, patterns of language loss, and the disengagement and alienation of second generation children and youth. These disparate pursuits, pursuits are requiring that we reimagine and we re-engineer education for an entirely new era, for the era of globalization 2.0. results of education should be lauded, that ought to be the beginning and not the end of the conversation, especially this morning in a conference on global peace. What should the purpose of a formal education be? What are its relationships to a happy life worth living? How can education be put to the service of human freedom, dignity, solidarity, and lifelong engagement? Well, these essential questions have been part of the archaeology of education in multiple traditions, Western and other alike. Globalization in the 21st century subverts the parochial tendency to limit the conversation strictly to local realities in bounded nation states. The paradox today is that while all education is local, the deep problems, including peace and its absence, that will shape the future, hence our children, are indisputably global. The tensions between these two powerful truths 
are increasingly obvious. The education for all the children in Maryland will lead us out of the paradox that we live local lives in an ever more global world that is more interconnected, miniaturized, and fragile. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that very insightful lecture. Um, we have time very quickly for about two questions. And I would remind the audience that when we ask questions, to just ask a question. That way we get more questions in. Yes, over okay. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Um, you mentioned uh, Los Angeles, for example, is home uh, to the largest citizens of uh, uh, 12 uh, countries outside of the country itself. Um, how would a school district, how would a classroom um, engage in implementing this with such diverse group of children, with such diverse languages spoken at home, perhaps? Right, so what an amazing challenge, what an amazing opportunity. Today we know through the most uh, important advances in cognitive neuroscience that multilingual, for example, multilingual children have extraordinary measurable advantages in terms of the jewel in the crown of our evolutionary uh, triumph the human neocortex, the neocortex that makes the child teach the adult in the little clip we saw, the child was teaching the adult. I mean, what made us uncomfortable about that clip is that the child is teaching the adult the rules of, of civilized discourse. I'm doing my part, you have to do your part, right? So what an extraordinary opportunity the schools of Los Angeles have today to flourish, to connect with uh, the linguistic reservoir with the culture, the exquisite cultural diversity that these new immigrant uh, communities are bringing uh, to our country. Today, the research suggests that um, the, the executive function, that's what drives learning, that's the metacognitive uh, skills, that is our ability to reflect on our own learning, Again, what we saw in that clip um, uh, is, is fundamentally different, uh, more, <laughs> more developed in the brains of multilingual children and adults than in, um, in uh, monolingual. So I think that what is seen as, uh, a, 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 as, a, uh, as a as a challenge, and it is a challenge needs to also be reframed as an opportunity. How pivoting from a, a paradigm of risk to a paradigm of resiliency, of strength, I think will get you more in the long term than, um, than getting stuck on the tired old um, deficiency paradigms. Um, I think that I will just, just make, uh, the, the first point is that uh, rescuing um, that linguistic reservoir is an important opportunity. You know, our country, one of my colleagues uh, at Harvard once said, we are the cemetery for languages. Uh, the Germans brought German, the Japanese brought Japanese, the Italians brought Italian, and we buried all these languages in our country. That is a regime of compulsive monolingualism is, um, is out of date, is dystopic. It, uh, it, it no, no longer serves a purpose. Immigrant origin children gravitate towards English faster now probably than ever before in the history of immigration to the United States. And there is a concurrent tragic pattern of language, first language loss. We, we can't have that anymore. We need to be able to chew and walk at the same time. K 
kids want to learn English, their parents want to learn English. We did a larger study of its kind at the time following new, our, new families coming to our country. And I've been doing basic research with immigrants for 30 years, and I've never had an immigrant parent tell me I don't want my kids to learn English, ever. So that's sort of one piece. Um, I think um, uh, another piece that is fundamental, and again, 100 years of basic research in, in, in cognitive psychology will, will, will suggest that all learning is relational. This is from Vygotsky to Jean Piaget to Jerry Bruner, who just died, by the way, uh, to Howard Gardner. All learning is relational. The teachers that don't know their students can't really teach. That's a kind of a form of malpractice. So we need to do much better to have teachers um, know and mirror the kinds of diversity that we see in, uh, in the classrooms. That's what we're doing at, at UCLA. We are, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of our efforts to really um, um, grow uh, uh, a teacher core that is, um, um, that reflects and, 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 and would be rooted back into the communities where, um, um, where, they, uh, where they come from. And, and the third issue is a very obvious issue, and just the demographics uh, make the case. Let me be very clear here. At, at a moment when the fastest growing sector of the US and child and youth population is this extraordinarily diverse cohort of, of young people, it's very obvious there is no happy American future if there is not a happy future for our ever more diverse young uh, population. And uh, this is something that we need to reflect and take, take very, very uh, seriously. I feel optimistic because, of course, our, the, our country is a country where immigration is history. It's sort of the narrative of how the country came to be in its present form. It is also destiny. The demography tells you the future of the United States and the future of <laughs> an amazing growing list of, of countries, uh, high and middle income countries the world over, is connecting with these new, uh, these new populations. So we have models, there are extraordinary models working with um, immigrant children, with refugee children. Uh, New York, the international schools in Brooklyn are extraordinary. There's a fabulous documentary called I Learn America, you should go see it, on immigrant children. Um, in LA we have multiple schools, the UCLA Lab School, the UCLA Community School. Um, so there are, there, there, but there are models all over the world. There are models in Israel. There are models in uh, Sweden. Uh, there are mo models in, in, in Canada. Canada has doubled the rate of immigration. We have. The Toronto schools won the award, the, the so-called German Nobel Prize, given to best practices for immigrant and refugee origin uh, uh, children. And who would have known that it takes a crack-smoking mayor of Toronto to produce the best schools for immigrant and refugee children, right? Uh, clearly, the mayor had nothing to do <laughs> with, his, with his schools, thankfully. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, there, there, we don't need to reinvent the, the wheel. There, are, there is uh, extraordinary uh, Good, uh, Reggio Emilia, of course, Reggio children, uh, uh, best practices for, um, for newly arrived uh, uh, children. 